It's awesome. But tonight we're kicking off our Braveheart Men's Conference, and I mentioned a minute ago, it's New Man Rising. Tomorrow, we're going to go down to the ranch, and I really hope that you will not just make tonight your only night. I really pray that you will come and be a part tomorrow. We're going to meet, we're going to meet from early in the morning, all day long. There's going to be a lot of activities going on. We're going to build a lot of relationships, but we're also going to spend time in prayer. We're also going to spend time in the Word. But we're also going to begin to get to know one another. And then we're going to come back on Sunday. We've got a great guest speaker for us on Sunday. He's also going to be speaking tonight. Uh, team, team, teaming with me up. Scott Turner brought his beautiful wife, Mary. I've known these guys for oh, 25 years now. Uh, they've been great friends of ours and uh, been parts of our church family for a long time. And it's just good to have friends for a long time. Amen. Amen. But I want to talk to you for a couple minutes before I get Scott up here. And I want to ask you this question. Can a man rise again? Can a man rise again? In John chapter 12, I love this. And Jesus was confronted with Lazarus' death. And Martha was complaining and said, Jesus, had you been here this wouldn't have happened. And he's saying, Martha, your brother will rise again. Come on, I want you to turn to the guy next to you and say, brother, you're going to rise again. Come on. <laughs> and if your wife is there, <laughs> say, honey, you're going to rise again. And if your son is there, look at your son and say, you're going to rise into a great man. And if your dad is there, tell your dad he's going to rise and continue to rise to be a great man. Because God is all about rising up men, raising up people. What I love about the gospel, the gospel is all about redemption. It's not about how messed up you are. It's about how great he is. It's, it's not about how much you've fallen or failed or struggled or what's going on in your life. It's all about how great God is. So here's the thing. Every man has a battle. Come on, somebody. How many know what I'm talking about? So, so, sometimes you, 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 you just get knocked down. Sometimes you have setbacks. Sometimes you have self-inflicted wounds. I was talking to a soldier one day, and he was, had, had his leg all wrapped up, and, and uh, he was limping, and I, I, and I said, what happened to you? And he says, I got, I, I got shot. A true story. You know, we got so many military around here, and I'm saying, wow, what, tell me what happened? He goes, well, it's kind of embarrassing. I shot myself on the, on the shooting range. <laughs> oh, it's one of those stories. But how many know sometimes we get wounded with friendly fire? It's like you're the last person I thought would be knocking me down and putting a bullet in me. And, and so we, we have friendly fire. And, 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 and sometimes we, we, we struggle as men to communicate we struggle with intimacy. We struggle finding words. Uh, men remind me sometimes, not all men, but some men remind me of small children who are trying to learn to talk. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You see a young child that's trying to learn how to express themselves. It's like, I'm hungry. I'm wet. I want to go to bed. I need, I need something, but they don't have the words yet. It's like, and it just comes out as this jumbled frustration. I'm, I'm convinced even after men learn how to use words, that doesn't change for many of them. <laughs> it still just comes out of this jumbled frustration. And, and, and here's my thing. Every man is going to have a battle. I want, you, I want you to look at this story. It's in your outline. and This is the story of, of Samson. And, 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 and Judges chapter 14, it says this. Samson went down to Timnar. Now, to his surprise, 
And just pause right there. To his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. Have you ever noticed, at least in my life, I've not been able to schedule my battles. Because if I could schedule them, I'd probably cancel them or put them off. It's like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, let's just cancel that battle. Let's just ignore that battle. Let's just not deal with that battle. At least in my life, it, it's the phone call you didn't want. It's, it's, it's the challenge you didn't need. It's the timing is never good. I'm not talking to anybody here. It's, and it's like, why me? And why now? And if you get into why me and why now, you're going to lose the battle before the battle even starts. Why me, why now is a self-attack on yourself when you need to prepare yourself for what you need to face. I mean, Eli's coming over from Yakima. And two cars back, the car got rear-ended, which rear-ended him. He texts me and says, uh, we've been in an accident, but we're okay. But we're still on our way. Come on, man. I, I mean, no, he didn't leave Yakima with planning. <laughs> right? It's like, hey, let's, let's go to Olympia and get in a car accident. That was not the plan. And suddenly and surprisingly, a young lion... Vital, healthy, strong, ferocious lion came to Samson. But I want you to look at this next verse. And it says, And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore into the lion apart, and he would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hands. But he, now watch this, but he did not tell his mother what, or father what he had done. Here's what I believe. If your faith is in God and you have a suddenly and you have a surprisingly, God is just waiting to jump all over you. God is just waiting to get all over you. God is just waiting to say, I want to raise you up. I want to help you get through this. I want you to fight this battle. I want to anoint you for this battle. Because as great and strong and as powerful as Samson was, he did not defeat the lion in his own power. He did not defeat the lion in his own ability. He won the battle because the Spirit of the Lord came out mightily upon him. I'm telling you, whatever lion is roaring at you, whatever mountain is facing you, whatever giant is coming at you, the Spirit of God is wanting to clothe itself upon you and say, you were born for this. You were made for this. You were created for this. You are my son, and you will rise again. You are my man for this time, for this moment, for this hour, for this instant. My Spirit wants to come upon on you for what you got to deal with and what you got to face. Because how many know in Scripture the lion can be either Christ or the lion can be the roaring lion, the enemy. So Samson takes out the lion, but it goes on. Now watch this. So it goes on to say, wow, you're going to have to give me a larger screen than that. And, <laughs> and sometime when he returned, yeah, that's not even going to work. Okay, we, we know better than that right there. Okay. And some time, after some time, when he returned to, to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. He took some of it in his hands and went along eating. And when he came to his father and mother, he gave them some and they ate. But look at this. But again, he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. I love this. How many know one of the symbolisms of the blessing of God? I'm taking you into land with milk and honey. And where was the honey? It was in the carcass of the lion. Your blessing is in your battle. Your blessing is in your battle. 
And so many men are running from their battle. And God said, but I'm trying to get you your blessing. But God, I don't want the battle. And God says, no, I need you in the battle so a new man, a new champion can arise. Because the honey is in the carcass of your championship battle. Now here's the irony of that. Here's the irony. Because Samson had this unique vow, it was called the Nazarite vow, which had all of these requirements of what he was supposed to do and not supposed to do. And one of the things he was not supposed to do was touch dead things, touch unholy things. And this is why he didn't tell his parents. Because I did something good, but I'm not sure it was good. I did something I'm proud of, but I'm not sure I should be proud of it. Because sometimes we get so religious, we don't think God gets in the messy stuff. And I can only be victorious when I don't have anything unclean in my life. The reason that the lion came and that he wasn't telling his parents because he didn't want to hear it because he was down walking around the vineyards and he wasn't supposed to have anything that looked like wine. Come on, somebody. What am I trying to say? We should always strive to be holy in our life. We should always strive for God's honor in our life. But if you think God will use you only because you got it all together, you're not reading the right Bible. Because when you read the Bible, God uses people who didn't have it all together. Who just were crazy enough to let his spirit come upon them and help them with the battles that they got to work through. And we know the story. Samson went on and still had some self-inflicted wounds, but God was still in the middle of his crazy life. God was still in the middle of his ups and downs and in and outs and his struggle. And he's trying to make it through life and trying to figure life out and trying to figure out who he was and what God had for his life. And, and here's what I'm saying. The blessing is in the battle. And here's, here's a question I want to ask. Some of you are here today. Well, let me read you this next verse. This next verse, and Samson tells the riddle, and he says, he says this. So he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat and out of the strong came something sweet there are some men here and you've got stories to tell let me ask you this question and I'm I'm asking you to do this if you face some lions in your life if you've had some battles in your life and you've fought some things And you've faced some things. And you've reached in and you've pulled the honey out of the blessing. You pulled the honey out of the carcass. You pulled the you pulled the victory out of your battle. You you pulled the blessing out of your battle. I want you to stand up. In fact, I want you to stand up. Stand up for me for a minute. I want to stand up for a minute. I want you to look at me. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at you. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, when I'm at the ranch, one of the things I love to hear is, tell me your story. I I, I don't want the story that makes it sound like it's arrived, because Samson hadn't arrived. I I, I don't don't want to hear the the polished Pollyanna version. I want to hear where it was at and what you did and how God showed up on you mightily and how God blessed you in your battle. Because I want to hear your story. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to look around and see some of these guys. And tomorrow when you're out there, I want you to walk up to some of them and say, I saw you standing there and I felt drawn to you in the service. And and, and, and just tell me your story. 
this verse right here. When my first wife committed suicide, I cannot tell you how I wanted to find a rock and crawl under it. I cannot tell you the last thing I wanted in the world was to be a pastor. The last thing I wanted in this life was a public life. I'll be honest, like, where are you, God? What just happened to my world? But I never lost my faith. And I let God begin to heal my heart. I didn't have all the answers. I didn't try to come up with the answers. I just tried to decide, God, what will I do? Will I still serve you? Will this broken, crushed, embarrassed, ashamed, defeated man, can I rise again? Can I get out of the ashes? And then Kelly came into my life. And God gave me this verse. Out of what was meant to destroy you came something to strengthen you. And out of what will be the hardest thing you've ever faced in your life, you will constantly drink from the sweetness of my spirit of how I was there but you didn't see me then and how I walked with you when you didn't see me then and how my goodness was there but you didn't know it then and now it's time to tell about it so I want to know your story I sit on this stage every week and you hear my stories but the same God that helps me And my brokenness is the same God that helps you in your brokenness. And the whole of the Christian story is about God redeeming people. It's not about people who had it all together. That was Jesus. Everybody else had stories. So I'm just taking you guys in. And I want you to spend time tomorrow asking, What's your story? And I don't have all the answers. I don't know how many people in this church who's lost a family member to suicide. And, and we get it. That moment, you don't have to explain it to me. We, sometimes we just hold each other and we weep. Sometimes we just hold each other. And we, I say to them, you and I belong to a club we never meant to join. And we don't try to explain it. We just feel it. We connect to it. And out of what was strong came something to eat. And out of the eater came something sweet. Go ahead and be seated. You ever hear the phrase? You ever hear the phrase? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger? That's not always true. That's not a Bible verse. No, listen, it's not a Bible verse. Because sometimes what doesn't kill you leaves you bitter. Sometimes what doesn't kill you leaves you cynical and jaded. Sometimes what doesn't kill you leaves you weakened. Sometimes what doesn't kill you leaves you with battle fatigue. I can't tell you the number of times... You know, I just, I just feel like I got battle fatigue. Been in ministry for 34 years, 35 years, and, and sometimes I just feel like I got battle fatigue. Sometimes I just want to sit down and say, I don't want another battle. But suddenly, a lion shows up. But I've learned to realize my blessing is in that lion. And this is not the time. For me to shrink back. Spirit of God, I need you one more time to come suddenly upon me so I can step back into the foray to, be in, to rise again and again and again as many times as I need to arise. See, let, let, me, let me go through this real quickly. 
I don't want to get Scott up here. Listen, listen, out of 2 Samuel 23, this is just some of the David's mighty men. Some of David's mighty men. And, and I'll illustrate this in a moment. Adino, the son of Enzite, was one of David's mighty men. Became a mighty man because he killed 800 guys. That's, that, that's serious. <laughs> Whatever you want to call that. That's, that, that's a serious warrior right there. Uh, Eleazar, the son of Dodo. And I love how they're the son of. That's my boy. That's my boy. Because fathers are meant to raise champions. Fathers are meant to raise champions. The Bible says he fought. When the fight was over, he couldn't even let go of his sword. They had to pry his hands open off the sword. Shama, the son of A.G., was standing in a field of lentils. And the Philistines attacked, and he would not get out of that field. Lentils or beans, it was his hill of beans. <laughs> You're not taking my beans. It's only beans, but they're my beans. And Shama fought and produced a great victory that day. The Bible doesn't mention the next three, but it says the next three of, were three of his chief men, three mighty men, and David was in the, 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 the stronghold one day, and he was saying, oh, for a drink from the waters in Bethlehem. I would just love to have a drink. And, and these men loved David so much that the Bible says that they broke through the garrison of the Philistines and went in and got him some water, got David the water, and brought it back to David. But you know what he did with the water? He looked at it said, you've risked your life to bring me water. And then he dumped it out. How many know that sounds like, wow, these guys risked their life for you. Here's the point. It's like, if you're in my troop and you're on my team and you fight with me, you are going to risk your life. But it's not for personal gain. I won't lead an army. I won't lead men in a self-serving leadership type of way. I don't ever want you to do that kind of foolish stuff again. I'm your leader. I'm your king. I'm, I, I'm, I'm your champion. But I don't want you to do things that just for me. I want, if you, you might die serving me. You might die in this army. But you're not going to die serving me. You're going to die serving the mission. They were mighty men in David. Abishai was the brother of Joab. Says he killed 300. Benaiah, the son of a valiant man from Kabzeel. The Bible says he went into a pit on a snowy day. How many wants to find a lion in a pit on a snowy day? When he came, when he came out, when he came out, he became the leader of David's royal guard. You're the guy that I'm going to trust to take care of me. They had stories to tell, but how many know not all stories end so well? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, excuse me, no, in Colossians, give me this next verse, in Colossians chapter 3, it says, put on the new man and be renewed in the knowledge of the image of him. See, Moses after he was exiled because see, his first battle didn't go so well. Moses, he was in exile and, and Moses rose again. Listen, Moses rose again after experiencing the burning bush. So you may have been to jail. You may have been to prison. You, you may have been, you may have like, you know, I used to serve God 40 years ago. I used to be on fire for God 40 years ago. I used to believe. I used to try. You need a new burning bush experience to rise again. David rose again after committing adultery and having one of his key trusted men that I was just listening about, having him assassinated in battle, rose again after he repented. 
says, God, i got to change my heart. My heart's gotten off course, God. I'm moving in the wrong direction. Elijah, after feeling like a failure, rose again, rose again, after he went a 200-mile journey to climb into a cave and realize God wasn't in the exciting thing. God wasn't in the fire. Come on, somebody. I, I meet some Christians. If, if, they, if they don't have a conference, if they don't have a word, if they don't have a move, if they don't fall down, they don't have nothing left. And sometimes you will have a crisis of your faith. And can you, can you climb into your cave and hear this voice of God and say, Elijah, what are you doing here? You need to rise again, my friend. Job, come on, Job rose again after he prayed for his friends. I love this verse. And the Lord restored Job's losses which he had prepared uh, after he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had. Listen carefully. Guys, this week and start praying for your friends. I'm believing that you're going to rise again. And the last one I will mention, I'm not going to go through all these scriptures, but this is what I want to really emphasize to you as you go into the rest of this, this weekend. Peter rose again. Peter rose again after he had a conversation with Jesus. See, what do you need to do? See, it's great to have the stories. It's like, but I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and look what God did, and, and you got this great story to tell. That's awesome. But sometimes we get knocked down. Sometimes we have setbacks. Sometimes we get discouraged. Sometimes we feel defeated. And I just want you to know, God wants to help you rise again. Turn to your neighbor and say, my brother's going to rise again. My brother's going to rise again. You're going to rise again, my friend. You are going to rise again. You're going to rise again. If your spouse is sitting next to you, you just go ahead and smile at them. Say, this marriage is going to rise again. Come on, we're going, to, we're going to raise this life again. Come on, somebody. we got some dreams in us. We're going to rise again. Our best days are ahead of us. But Peter, listen, Peter need to have a conversation. If you know the story, I don't, I'm not going to read all these scriptures to you. But after Jesus' death, Peter said, I'm going fishing. I was going to go fishing. I don't know why Peter would want to. Now, Peter, fishing was his career. But it wasn't a very good one because when you read the Bible, anytime he went fishing, he never caught anything. <laughs> Peter needed to go do something else with his life because he was not a very good fisherman. And so Peter says, I'm going fishing. This is after the Lord is resurrected. He says, I'm going fishing. Here's what I want you to notice. The other said, we're going with you. Listen, when you rise again, you're like the tide in the harbor. You start raising everybody else's life around you. But when you choose not to rise again, you start lowering everybody else's life around you. Whether you want to admit it or not, every life has a circle of influence. Every life has attachments to them. And if I'm not climbing, I'm sinking. But when I'm climbing, I'm going to pull people with me. And when I'm sinking, I'm going to pull people with me. And Peter is sinking. And he said, I've been following Jesus for the last three and a half years. I know he's rose from the dead. I told him I was going to do all this for him. I failed him. So I'm just going to go back to what I know how to do, which is to be a failure. And Jesus showed up and said, hey, guys, you caught anything? You know the answer, nope. Fished all night, caught nothing. <laughs> but they didn't know it was the Lord, the Bible says. They didn't know it was the Lord. Now watch this. Then John said to him, Peter, it's the Lord. I love this. They're over there pulling in more fish than they know what to do with. It's bonus fishing day. It's the best day of fishing Peter's ever had in his whole career. But when John says it's the Lord, he reaches over, puts on his clothes, and then jumps in. I'm done. I'm not going back anymore. You can have the fish, you can have the boat. The only thing I want, I'm taking my coat. I'm going to go spend the rest of my life following Jesus. And when he went and had a conversation, he had a conversation. Now here's what I want to get at. 
Because I want you to have a conversation with Jesus this week, guys. Because if you have a conversation with him, he'll rise again. He said, Peter, do you love me? You know, Lord. Then take care of my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Take care of my kids. Take care of my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Peter, I have a question for you. Do you love me? Are there some things, listen carefully. I know some men are running from God. Some men get so busy, but they don't have that conversation with God. Are there some things God wants to say to you? Are there some things God wants to say to me? Or maybe there might be some things you want to say to God. Are there some things that are in your heart? Can I encourage you this weekend especially? Guys, you're going down the ranch, you're at the campfire, find some quiet time. If you come down, you know, tomorrow during the day, find some time. But don't let the next 48 hours pass and you having a conversation with Jesus. If you're sitting in the church, you can still have a conversation with Jesus and listen. Do you understand? God, what do you have for me? God, what do you want to say to me? And what do you want to say to God? God, I'm ready. God, I want to move beyond. I want to go forward. And I believe God is going to raise up some men to do some powerful things this weekend. I'm going to talk to you about this in different times this weekend. But I want to have Pastor Scott, who pastors an incredible church in uh, Oklahoma. Come on. Oklahoma. Come on. <laughs> Oklahoma's okay. He told me Oklahoma's okay. But I've known Scott and Mary for, gosh, like I said, for 20 plus years. And Scott, we're so glad to have you. Can we give Scott a great big warm welcome as he comes to the stage? Hey, why don't you all stand up? Just stretch a little. Come on. Man, rise. Do what Pastor Dave just told us. Rise up. Come on, stretch it out. I won't be that long tonight. Man, what a privilege it is to, to be with you guys. Go ahead and be seated, guys and gals and teens and kids. Wow, this is awesome. Met some new pastor friends already. I'm, I'm loving it. Uh, man, Pastor Dave, I, I'll probably save it for Sunday, but he's been so instrumental in my life. And uh, for whatever reason, we just kind of got disconnected. I'll put it on me. I disconnected. Sorry. I for, will you forgive me? Okay. But we're, we're reconnected. And um, I, think, I think we met you when, I think, I think maybe when Drew was like three, four, or five years old. So yeah, and uh, so we've known him for a long time, but um, again, what, a, what an honor it is to be with you guys. Um, Pastor Dave talked about rising, but I want to kind of talk about new men running. I want to talk about running to win tonight, because once you get up, you got to do something. Can somebody say amen? amen? Awesome. I'm looking back at the sign, and it says 30 years, 1989. Pastor Dave said, share your story. So in 1989, I got kicked out of Christian University. That's part of my story. But one of the greatest things that ever happened to me, I was involved in all kinds of craziness. They found out about a little bit of the craziness. Aren't you glad no one knows all the craziness? But for what they found out, it was enough to get me out of there. And, uh, but I uh, went through about six months of just the worst time in my life. Uh, and then God showed up. Uh, and uh, I wasn't living for him. I wasn't uh, even interested uh, but he showed up right in the middle of my nonsense, and thank God for that. And so uh, a week ago, 30, 30 years and a week ago, I uh, got on a plane and went to Sweden and went to Bible college, and from then on I've been in full-time ministry and haven't looked back, and God is so good, and his grace is amazing. And I, I met Mary over in Sweden. She's not Swedish. Long story. Don't have time for it tonight. Uh, but met her, and um, we've been married for 26 years, have two daughters, uh, both of them are living in Sydney, Australia, going to Hillsong Bible College uh, down there. So they got as far away from us as earthly possible. <laughs> We're trying not to take that personally. Uh, but no, they're great girls. They love God, and they're uh, pursuing some stuff in ministry. I just want to say again, what a great time of worship tonight. What a great word already. So this is just kind of bonus. But grab your notes. Let's kind of jump into it uh, tonight. And, you know, the Bible is clear and uses it over and over and over again that life is a race. Life is a race, but it's not a sprint, 
It's a marathon. We know all this stuff, right? You've been around church. And the Bible also reveals that many start in this race, but only a few finish. In fact, when you look at all of the people mentioned in the Bible, it's 2,931 people. And, and out of those, almost 3,000, we only have a lot of details on about 100 of those people. Some of them are just mentioned by name in the begets, 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 that kind of thing. But about 100 of them, we have enough information to formulate kind of how did they live for God. And out of those 100, only 30 of them finished well. Think about that. 30 out of 100. Dr. Robert Clinton, he's a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, he spent nearly 20 years studying every leader in the Bible. He studied 49 of them because there was the most information on those. He came to the same conclusion after studying leaders in the Bible for 20 years that right at a third of them finish strong. So in other words, you start the race, but you don't finish the race. Everyone starts running, but there are things that detour us. And instead of running, now some are limping. Come on, somebody. Instead of limping, some have become disqualified. And so I want to talk to you tonight about three things that have been big in my life that have weighed me down. Believe it or not, you look at my building, you go, you're not a runner. Believe it or not, I am a runner. I run so I can eat. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm not kidding. You're laughing, but that is a serious statement. I run. It's all about burning calories so I can fill up on that delicious street corn that we just had out there. I would have ate 50 of them if I could have. That was so good. But I want to talk to you kind of about running this race. And um, again, think about that. Am I the only one that thinks this is shocking? One in three finish. One in three finish. I wonder if anything's changed. I wonder if the stats have changed. I started exactly 30 years ago in ministry. And only by the grace of God, I'm still here, still running. But I can, I can name friend after friend after friend that they're not in the, you know, they're in the race, but they're, they're out of the race. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're still breathing, but they're not really living. You know, the battle, they didn't get the honey out of the battle. They didn't get the blessing out of the battle. The battle got the best of them. And so they're, 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 they're sidelined. They're shipwrecked. And so... We're going to look at a scripture in just a minute. It's one that's very familiar to all of us. It's, if you have your Bible, you can turn to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll look in verse 7 there. But before, before we read this text, I think we need to just take a step back and realize what was happening when this was pinned by Paul. He's old, white hair, beard, uh, maybe long, unkept. He's come to the very end of his days. Everything now is behind him. Uh, he's in a dungeon. He's in a prison. Uh, and he is chained to Roman guards. He's got no freedom. He's got no money, no earthly possessions of his own, no comfort, no warmth. He's got no companionship. He's all alone. And again, he's cuffed to this Roman guard on one hand. But with his other hand, he's writing his protege, Timothy. Come on, somebody. Only his memories now, and now he's reflecting. He wouldn't start another church. He wouldn't go on another missionary journey. He, he's facing the inevitable. He's close to death, and by the way, he knew it. In fact, let me tell you, in verse 6, he says, As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. We'll stop there for a minute. All of his companions had distanced themselves from him. Everyone that followed him, loved him, supported him, none of them are around. And every day he would hear coming down those dungeon stairs the boots of a Roman soldier. You know, Paul never knew from this moment on which day would be his last. How terrifying would that be? He hears the boots, he wonders, is it today? Is this it? But still faithfully, cuffed in one hand, pinning these words, that's why when we handle this text, we need to realize, we need to realize the power behind this. Come on. We need, we, need, we, need to, we need to feel the full force of what's happening at this moment. So he continues to write. Now, he's a Roman citizen, so they wouldn't crucify him. They wouldn't torture one of their own. But we know he gets beheaded. Not, not too long 
after he pins these words. So back to this letter. He's about to be executed. He's all alone and under a dim torchlight, he's pinning these words to his protege. So we should place this text that we're going to read right now in a very special category. We should handle this with great care. And we should get the full force of what he was writing. Are you ready to hear the text? Here it is, 2 Timothy 4, 7. You know this verse. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have kept the faith. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all, for all who run, for all who finish, for all who fight the good fight. I hope you get a hold of that. Paul was one of those 30% that finished well. Absolutely. You know, he was just following Jesus who, who authored finishing well, finished perfectly. But Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Run after me as I run for Christ. And he reminded Timothy to run the race. In the letter to the Hebrews, I don't know if you know who wrote it. It, I think it was Paul. Other theologians think it was somebody else. But in the book of Hebrews, we'll share another scripture in just a minute, but in chapter 2, verse 1, it won't come up on the screen, but the writer is warning. I'll just say Paul. I believe it's Paul. Paul is warning against drifting away. Getting off, getting out of your lane. Running the race, but getting detoured. In chapter 3, he says, be careful, don't harden your heart, and don't turn away in unbelief. This theme continues in chapter 5. He says, you guys are spiritually dull, and, and sometimes you don't listen. I can relate to that. And he says, you're like a bunch of babies. He said it, I didn't say it, okay? Don't get mad at me. And then in chapter 10, he says, don't throw away your confidence, Patient endurance is what you need. Then here's our key scripture tonight, Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded, but why is the therefore, therefore? Why is that there? Because he's already been bringing correction throughout the entire letter. And he goes, now remember, the whole reason for all of this is because we got to run. And, and, and we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to this life of faith. Remember he says, I have fought the good fight. I've run this race. I've finished my course. And here's what he says. He says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. So are you going to be one of the 30%? Are you going to be the one out of three? Are you going to be the new man that rises? And when you rise, are you going to be the new man that's running? It's our choice. I want to encourage you tonight. We're going to talk about stripping off some weights. These are three things that I've dealt with over and over and over again in my life. I hope they relate to you. Then we'll pray for some people tonight, see what God wants to do. But here's the first one. The first weight, if we're gonna run, you can't run with worry. What's holding you back? Worry holds you back. There's so many things to worry about in this world, come on. You know, just about a week ago, we were just getting ready to signed papers on our second campus as a church and had the deal all ready to go. And out of nowhere, they pulled the building off the market. No, no communication. They just, just in an instant. So either we can sit there and worry about it and go, oh no, you know, feel sorry for ourselves, take on all that stuff. But man, when you're running, you got to strip down. I was visiting my older brother. My older brother, Derek, pastors a church in Charlotte, North Carolina. My younger brother, Kyle, pastors a church in Kansas City and uh, Hillsong, Kansas City. And so I've got brothers that pastor, but I was over, we were visiting my brother, and I had just started running again. 
and I'm out running. It was cold in Charlotte, believe it or not. It was like, it was like high 40s. It was in the morning. Sun had just come, just was barely coming out, and I'm running. I had a sweatshirt on, and this is when I was kind of learning how to run. So I was all bulked up with these sweatpants and a sweatshirt and and not great shoes, and I'm out there running, and 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 all of a sudden this dude flies by me. Now remember, I'm running to eat. This guy's like training for a marathon or something. He runs by. He's got a tank top. It's 48 degrees. A tank top and those little girly shorts. You guys really, no offense, girls, but you know what I'm talking about? Those little light, little, little, you know, shorty shorts. And he just goes blazing by me. And so I try to keep up. That lasted about 30 yards. But he was a real runner. But real runners know you got to strip down. You can't run with a lot of weight. You, 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 you know, you, 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 can't, you can't run with worry. How far are you going to get with that thing? Are you with me? I mean, I can do a little running, but a mile, two, 13, no. So this is a weight. Some of you here tonight, the Bible's called us to live by faith. We need to say by run by faith. But guess what? You got that worry. And worry is ultimately playing God. It's saying, God, I've got this. I'm taking care of my own life. Ultimately, it's pride. I think almost all that sin goes back to that pride thing, and we've all done with that, dealt with that. But what's holding us back, worry is. Here, let's just rapid fire these scriptures. They're on your outline. Let's just go real quick. Proverbs 12, 25, worry weighs a person down. Well, when 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 you're called to run, you don't want to be weighed down. You want to be light. Psalms 55, 2, I am worn out by my worries. Life it, it, it by itself wears you out. Come on, somebody. That's why his mercies are new every morning. Amen. He refreshes us. But when you worry, guess what? You're going to get worn out. Psalms 25, 17, my awful worries keep growing. How many of you know when we keep worrying about something, we're giving power to that thing? All of a sudden, that it's not just one of these, it's two of these. All of a sudden, I got three or four of these hanging off me. One on each arm, one off my leg, one around my neck. You can't run with that. So worry weighs us down. Jesus said in Matthew 6, which one of you by worrying can add anything to your life? Nothing good comes out of worry. It's unhealthy. It's unhelpful. It's going to wear you out. And so what's, how can we run fast? How can we run free? Write this down. Instead of worrying, pray. Which one, you, which one do you think is going to help you? And guys, I'm going to tell you right now. I think the ladies blow us away on this one. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I think when it comes to prayer, we got a lot of room to make up. I'm not calling it a competition between men and women. I'm just saying, I think generally, the ladies are a little more in tune. They, they, no, no, just me. Don't look at me so holy. Come on now. I don't know about you, but when it comes to prayer, again, I think, you know, I think, I, Lord, I think I got this. I think, I, I think I'm good. Psalms 55, 22, give your worries to the Lord and he will take care of you. It's a wonderful thing what happens when you're stressed out, you're worried. It's weighing you down. We're supposed to be running, but now we're just kind of limping along. We're, we're carrying this, this burden. It's a wonderful thing what happens when the Holy Spirit comes in and just settles you down and gives you peace. And that worry just dissipates. God shows up. Doesn't mean that the situation changed, but you changed. Doesn't mean that everything's better now, but guess what? We know that he's in control. Anybody here tonight? So let's, let's leave the worry. to Let's cast it on the Lord. Let's let it go. Let's let, let's let him take care of that. Here's the second thing. Not only does worry hold us back when we're running, but wounds. Pastor Dave kind of hit on this real quick about being bitter, about being wounded, holding on to stuff, 
holding on to unforgiveness and resentment and bitterness. And that stuff, man, that stuff grows. Stuff grows in the dark. Funky stuff grows in the dark. Come on. And if you're sitting here tonight and you've got anything against anyone, anything against anyone, that's pretty broad, but that's the Bible. We got to let that go. Well, 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 Scott, you don't know what they did to me. No, you're right. I don't know. Do you know what they did to Jesus? Well, 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 you have no idea that they purposefully did this. They purposefully crucified our Savior. My older brother, Derek, I mentioned him a minute ago. His first wife, she was seven months pregnant. They were in a car with some friends. They got slammed by a drunk driver. And the car flipped and... He wasn't sure what had happened, but he was sitting over on the curb. He was, he was messed up a little, but he looked over and across the street, about 40 feet away from him is the, the drunk dude that just slammed into their car. Now, what he doesn't know is that his wife is being rushed to the hospital. She's not there anymore. And his unborn child, and they're gonna be DOA at the hospital. He doesn't know that. So he's sitting there and the Lord speaks to him and says, Derek, and he's looking at this guy and he says, Derek, I need you to forgive him right now. And so he does. And he lets it go. I mean, he really lets it go. Not some token prayer, but heartfelt. You know, he never got bitter. God restored him. Now, she's in heaven, baby's in heaven. God restored him with a new wife. He's got a 21-year-old daughter. This happened a long time ago. But me, on the other hand, I was in my first ministry assignment. I was working for this guy, nationally known. I was young, just back from Sweden. And this guy got into all kinds of crazy stuff. There's kids in the room, we're not gonna go there. So if you can think of, he was into it, crazy. And somehow, I don't know how or why, but I found out about this stuff. It was all secretive. And I found out, and it crushed me. And I called my pastor on the phone. I said, what should I do? He said, just get out of there. Just pull a Joseph and run. Just go. And grab grab the evidence with you. But go. Grab it and go. So I did. And I resigned immediately. And I left. But you know what the issue was? As I left, I left bitter. And my pastor had warned me, but I didn't listen. And for two years, for two years, I was serving God, I was tithing, I was giving, I was in youth ministry at the time, I was just doing my best, but man, I was in a self-inflicted wilderness because I was wounded and I wouldn't let it go. And the minute God showed me that ugliness, that resentment, it really honestly that hatred That's what it had grown into, that I hated him. As soon as he showed that to me, man, I let it go immediately. And I'm not kidding, everything in an instant changed. But compared to what had gone on with my brother, that was nothing. So it doesn't have to be some huge life-changing thing. It could be something small. But no matter what, the enemy will use that because he, he doesn't want us to finish well. He wants you to run filled with that burden of hurt and being wounded and that rejection and that resentment and that unforgiveness and that bitterness. And man, it is a huge problem in the church today. The church is split over one little thing, one little difference but the enemy knows exactly what he's doing. He's the accuser of the brethren. He brings in division. And where there's envy and strife, there's every evil work, where there's that bitterness and that resentment. But see, we're called to run. But man, we got got this, we got these wounds. And they're weighing us down, they're holding us back. Not just worry, but wounds. Let's rapid fire these scriptures real quick. Psalms 109, 22. My heart is wounded within me. Does that describe you? Are you? Would you be honest tonight? 
Is that where you're at? Is your heart wounded within you? Hebrews 12, watch out that no bitterness takes root among you for it. For as it springs up, it causes deep trouble, hurting many in their spiritual lives. In Job 18.4, your anger is hurting no one but you. Job 21.25, others have no happiness at all. They live and they die with bitter hearts. So what's the antidote? How do we get rid of that weight? You already know it. You already know all this. Forgive. Say with me, say forgive. It's the only way. It's the only way. Jesus on the cross, you know his words. Some of the last ones he spoke. Father, Father, they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. Hanging on a cross, still releasing, blessing. That's why he raised the bar and he said, do good to those that hurt you. Amen? They smack you on the cheek, offer the other one. Are you with me? Some of you have been holding on to some stuff. No wonder we're limping. No wonder we're not running for his glory. No wonder we've been detoured. But we've got to forgive. Get rid of all bitterness, no more hateful feelings of any sort. Instead, forgive one another as God has forgiven you through Christ. That's Ephesians. Is it on your notes? Chapter 4, 31, 32. How, let me ask you this. How has God in Christ forgiven you? Listen closely. Instantly, completely, and permanently. So how should we forgive? Instantly, completely, and permanently. But what do we do? We don't. We make people earn it. We forgive with strings attached, and it's not really forgiveness until they make it up to us. That's human nature, but that's not Christ's nature. But we're new men rising, come on, new women rising. I wanna encourage you, we need to run, and we can't be weighed down by worry, we cannot be weighed down by wounds, and finally, here's the last one, what's holding us back, wrongs. Just straight up, remember our key verse, the weights and the sins. So there's weights, but there's also the sins that so easily weigh us down. Three, four weeks ago now, I did a funeral for a guy in our church. He was a middle school principal, then he was the high school athletic director. And he had done some, kind of done just a dumb thing one night. And we're in a pretty small town and he lost his job. He got another good job, but Somehow, with God's mercy, he, he got another job. And we saw God just start to restore him. And I tell you, just a few months after that, he just made another, just a, a terrible decision. Had a wife, four kids. And he just, just in a night, he went out, did some stupid stuff. He ends up, finds himself in a gun battle. This isn't a guy who carries a gun, but where he was at, there was a gun there. I'm not gonna go into a lot of details, it's not appropriate, but he's with another man's wife, and that other man shows up with a gun, starts shooting, he grabs a gun, starts shooting back, they kill each other in a gun battle. Brutal, brutal funeral. Looking down at these four little kids, and this wonderful woman, and now he's gone. Remember we talked about one in three? You guys remember? Terrible situation, tragic. But we have a real enemy, and he can take those little tiny things in our life, and he can wreck our lives. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to scare anybody here tonight. I'm leaving out details that if we were just the guys here, I'd probably share some more. But, man, we're, we're running for the glory of God. This is all for him. Can't play around with stuff. What's holding a lot of people back? Wrongs. Remember I told you, 
These are the three big ones in my life. Worry, getting wounded, and then just those wrongs. Let's rapid fire those scriptures. Psalms 51.3, I know all about my wrongs. I can't forget my sin. Isaiah 59.2, your wrongs have separated you from God and your sins have made him hide his face so that he doesn't hear you. Proverbs 28.13, if you hide your sins, you will not succeed. But if you confess and reject and abandon them, you will receive mercy. You look at the difference between David and Saul. And really what David did seems so much worse than what Saul did. But what Saul did was idolatry. What, and he wouldn't own up to his sin. David committed adultery and murder, but guess what? He owned it. And because, remember, here's the verse. The verse is, look at it again, Proverbs 28, 13. If you hide your sins, you will not succeed. But if you confess and reject and abandon them, you will receive mercy. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we're trying to run this race, but we've got these wrongs, and we know we're wrong. We know what we've got going on in our life. And you probably heard it preached a hundred times if you're at this church. It's the habits, the hang-ups, it's the little things in our heart that we know are there. But guess what? We're new men rising. Come on. And we rise so that we can run. And when we run, we can't be weighed down. What are, those, what are those things in your life that are weighing you down? We're running this race, and only one in three in the Bible make it. Philippians 3.13, I'll, I'll be quick and we'll be done. I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Come on, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. We're focusing on the future, not the past. We are pressing on. We're not getting stuck. Acts 20, 24, the only value Paul said I place on my life is that I may finish my race. Psalms 2, verse 12, if you make a run for God, you won't regret it. 2 Corinthians 9, 24, is this too much for you guys? Is this too much for y'all? 2 Corinthians 9, 24, you know that in a race, all the runners run but only one runner gets the prize. So let's run like that, run to win. Amen? Now let me say real, make, make sure you get this. Man, nobody in here is perfect. <laughs> nobody on this stage is perfect, far from it. Far from it, we have an awesome God. We have a loving God. We have a merciful God. We have a gracious God. We have a good, good Father. And he's already paid for our freedom. So let's run free. Let's pick up the pace. Are you with me? Amen. Would you bow as we close in prayer? If you're here tonight, and you know there's something right now in your life that's got you worried? Something in your life right now where you're wounded and you know it? Someone hurt you? Someone did you wrong? And man, human nature is I gotta get them back. No, that's the Lord's. We gotta let it go. All we gotta do is run. You're here tonight and there's some wrong you know it. You know, you know deep in your heart, there's just something I got to let go of tonight. So worried, wounded, or some type of wrong, I'm just going to ask you to be bold. Would you stand up tonight? We're all in this together. Would you do it? Would you stand up and stand into freedom? I guarantee you God's going to show up in your life right now. Truth is, I'm standing, so I'm, 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 I'm responding to this. God is my witness, that's true. Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. You know, 
Guys, I'm so thankful for a group of guys that are hungry for God. You're out here on a Friday night. You could be anywhere doing anything else, guys and gals, teens and kids, all of you. But guess what? You're here. You know what that says? You want to run. It's time to run. Come on, aren't you tired of being held back? I am. Aren't you tired of just kind of keeping a mediocre pace? I am. I think God wants to just put a fresh wind in our sails tonight. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen. Whom the Son sets free is radically and completely free. And that's what's happening here tonight. Man, a lot of people standing up. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to invite Pastor Dave to come and pray. But here's what I want you to do. I just want you to link up with those people around you. Come on. Just get your arms on them all, all around. Arms, hands, grab them. I want Pastor Dave to pray over us tonight and then do whatever he wants to do. And we'll do that. Come on. Thanks, God. Come on, let's just begin to stand in his presence. Father, I thank you for the ministry of the word tonight. Your word tells us to lay aside every weight and every sin which so easily snares us. And there's a voice coming from heaven. We're surrounded by so great a cloud of witness. Your encouragement is strong. Your encouragement is bold. Your encouragement is loud. Lay aside. Set it down. Let it go. Live with mission. Live on purpose. Live with focus. Live with reason. Set down those things. And Father, all over this room, I, I, I stand with these men. I stand with my brothers. I stand with my friends. Father, we want to finish well. Father, for those of that have, thus that may have fallen, I'm asking you to raise us up one more time. For those of us that might have had some setbacks, God, because we've been carrying worries and weights and wounds, I'm, I'm asking God that we can just put off our rucksack, God, and, and we can just put on your mantle and we can pick up ourselves and we can begin to run again uh, and with our eyes focused on you. Restore our vision. Restore our hearts. Restore our dreams. Restore our hopes, God. Father, I'm asking that there's a washing that's going through every man's life right now. I'm asking, Father God, that there's a cleansing that's going on right now. Father, I thank you that we're beginning to eat the honey, Father, that might be in the carcass. Father, we're beginning to eat the blessing that's been in the battle. Father, we've been in struggling with some things and we've got some battle fatigue, but I thank you there's a grace that's being released on every man. Come on, men, pray for that guy standing beside you. I know God wants to help you, but one of the ways he helped you is like Job. Job was restored when he prayed for his brothers, when he prayed for his friends, and when God restored him, it was twice as much. I'm believing that God's best is for you yet to come. I'm believing that God's best days for you are still to come. I don't care how old you are. I'm believing that God has dreams that He wants to stir in you. Vision He wants to stir in you. Let Him impregnate you right now. Let Him stir your heart right now. Let Him stir your faith right now. Dream again. Believe again. Declare again. Pray for that man next to you that he would be strong, that he would be the head and not the tail, the top and not the bottom, that he's blessed going out and blessed coming in. God, he's your child. He's your son. He's your brother. Father, we stand with him in prayer right now. We pray boldly right now. Come on, guys. Press into the Spirit for just a moment and believe for God to do something incredible, incredible, incredible in their life. Father, I'm declaring that this night is the launching point of a new season and a new chapter that Father you're going to do something that's going to rise up men are going to rise out of the fire men are going to rise out of their struggles they're going to rise out of their battles and they're going to put their eyes on you and like Scott said we're going to lay aside some stuff and we're going to run God we're going to run the vision that you have for us we're going to press towards the prize of the prize of God in Christ Jesus Father we declare this